Let's jump into some financial talk here. Yeah. You know, we had a conversation before where you called retirement a bad word. Mm-hmm. And kind of I wish it was just four letters long so I, I could <laughs> say it's the a four really the really bad word, right? Um, but you have a theory of moving instead of thinking about retirement, you move more towards a work optional life. It, indeed. So, uh, if you think about the word retirement, you go back to say 1937, when they really rolled out Social Security, that's the first time we started using the word retire to apply to human beings. You see, prior to that, you would retire an old piece of equipment. You would retire a horse to the glue factory. Or you would grab your scotch in a cup and retire to the den for the evening. That meant I'm no longer of any use. We just didn't apply that to people. Remember your American history classes? They would say, like, did Ben Franklin, any of our forefathers be like, well, we're retiring now. We're not going to bring any more value to the universe. <laughs> no. They continue to form a country well into their old age. Well, look at what we do today. Most entrepreneurs aren't interested in retiring. In fact, most people, even in the armed forces, who have like a very set date of retirement, it's like, I am retiring, meaning I'm taking this income and I'm going to go do something else. Retirement is not what we thrive on as human beings. And for most entrepreneurs, they definitely don't. So what we started to talk about is that retirement, no wonder nobody wants to plan for it. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> but if but what everybody does want with some conversation is, I want to have financial independence for the sake of funding a work optional lifestyle. And so it's no longer about just building it up in financial tools. It's buying some financial tools and doing things like whether somebody invests in real estate or they have some amazing other business that they're gonna build, whatever it is that they do, we just need to create enough passive income that they no longer have to work for money. Live off of that passive income. Now, when you reach what we call definite financial independence, it's when that passive income can pay all of your expenses. And then you may continue to work, and when you do, it's just 100% savings right now. Because if you were saving 100% of your earned income, regardless of what you do for a living right now, business owner or employee, how easy is it to have that next negotiation? Whether you're negotiating a lease, negotiating a large, large business deal, negotiating a buyout of your business, or as we have a client that's literally going to go into a major company this year and say, hey, I only want to do like this part of my job that's super specialized. I'll work for you guys about one day a week, but I still want a little over half of my total salary and benefits package. And the only reason he can go in and have that negotiation is because he doesn't need the income because he's already has the ability to save nearly 100% of what he makes. Changes the entire conversation. Changes everything. It's a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. I have this conversation with a lot of people in the very early stages of this conversation where, you know, the American dream was retire at 65, right? I mean, that's what we've been bred as a society Mm -hmm. to. That's just, hey, at 65, you're going to retire, which I think a lot of people now are finding out that that's not the case anyway that are there. But, you know, I always, I'm a firm believer in it's not about your pile of cash when you hit 65. In fact, I don't, I have no interest in retiring at 65. I'd rather retire at 40. Indeed. Right. And so, or hit work optional life. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, right, right, right. Had yeah, bad word. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to listen to future podcasts and see if you say it that exactly, way. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. But this is, you know, for me, it's about cash flow. And of course, in, in real estate, it's Indeed. about, you know, getting rentals and having that passive income coming in. But I, I love that mindset of we're ditching the word retirement. Indeed. And think about the simple, like there were advertisements for years of people carrying around their number as if that's the number you need at age 65. I've seen those. Yeah. That, like how many points should you have on the scoreboard as a football team at halftime? <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and it doesn't matter because there's half a game left to play. You know, if you have a couple who are healthy at age 65, they have a 50% chance of making it to age 93 and a 50% chance of living longer than 93. Wrap your head around that. That means our money in our old age will have to last as long or longer than it took us to accumulate all the capital. That means you can't pretend like that number at age 65 matters because what matters is the cash flow for the rest of your life and whether or not that cares for your conditions of life or what's important to you to live the rest of your life the way you want to. 100%. What do you see? I mean, you get to see a lot of different situations, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of different people. 
uh, trend wise, what do you see people making the biggest mistake on? I think uh, well, people we work with a lot are what I call Henry's, high earners, not rich yet. And so these are the folks that make uh, you know three hundred thousand to two million dollars of income a year, and yet they don't have the assets that could duplicate that income on their balance sheet. So we're helping them accomplish that. Well, for most people, they don't actually have a strategy for what they want the future to be for them. What they do is they have surplus because they're making good money. So they set it aside, set it aside, set it aside, and then there's some opportunity. Like, oh, there's a piece of real estate and somebody shared with me about it. And so I'm going to go buy that piece of real estate. And that eats up that surplus they saved. And then the surplus builds up again. And then some financial product person comes to sell them something and they buy that thing. And they're kind of collecting, but it's a collection in a junk drawer financially. Or if you were watching Breaking Bad when it was released, it's like the pallet of cash in a storage <laughs> yes. unit. And this, if you go back and watch that, there's like this three-minute conversation of how much is enough. And, and the, in our application, when clients fill it out, potential clients, I should say, fill that out, it says right on there, do you know how much capital work is going to be required for you to have financial independence? And almost no one has an answer. Now, think about this. This is definitely a trend. But it's one we should all be aware of. Because what do we do every day? We get up out of our bed. We head to work. We do our jobs the best we can. We do a good job of taking care of our family. And we save some money to get to a number we haven't even defined yet. That would be like jumping in my car right now. And people are like, where are you going? And I go, east. <laughs> and they're like, what are you trying to get to? And I'm like, a place that looks like this. East. <laughs> We're yeah, trying to get to yeah. east. <laughs> it's like it's going to have trees and some rocks and maybe some tall buildings. And now we haven't even defined it's New York. And we haven't defined how far it is or how long it's going to take. And yet we're, we would never do that in a car. But people are doing that every day with their money. People listening right now, walking their dog or doing dishes or driving to work are doing so with no idea how much capital it's actually going to take. They just know it's going to be more than what they have now. So that's part one. Part two is people also haven't articulated what kind of life they want to live today, like really articulate it. So all the advertisers, everybody coming in has a narrative of more, more than what I have now. I currently have this, but a Tesla would be nice. I currently have this house, but I'd really like something that's bigger. And it's always something more than what I have now because if they don't articulate, this is what I want my future to look like, then they can't really be truly satisfied when they arrive at it. So those are the two major trends I see that hold people back. You know, and everybody else says, well, it's this tactic at investing. And None of those things erode people's wealth as much as not having a true destination and awareness of how much capital it's going to take in the future for them to be financially independent and an inability to articulate what's actually going to make me happy in my lifestyle today for me and my spouse to get on the same page about that. It's a huge deal. Having a plan. I mean, that's something that we talk a lot about when you're building investment portfolios. Mm -hmm. You need to, and of course, the military teaches 90% preparation, 10% mm -hmm. execution, yes, right? Yes, yes. And that really does speak to, hey, we need to have a roadmap here. And to your point, your analogy was really solid. I use it a lot is if you're going to go on a road trip, you're not just going to get in the car and go. You're going to have an idea of where you're going to stop, what roads you're going to take. Like you have a plan and that makes it like it's we're not thinking about it. We and can... even, even if you're loosey-goosey about it, you're still going to have an end destination. And so many people don't even have the end destination. 100%. 100%. So building a roadmap. Um, what about you in the beginning? I mean, we weren't always at this position here mm -hmm. as CEO. And, you know, What did you do in the beginning to kind of establish that roadmap? How did you decide what kind of life you wanted to live? That's a great question. So for me, I remember when I lived in Las Vegas... And the biggest thing I was concerned about was I just need to save a bunch of money every single month and had no real destination, just like every client. And then I got introduced to a book after I moved up here, actually. So this is back in 2012. And the book was called Stop Acting Rich and Start Living Like a Real Millionaire. Now, I really wish it's, the author's name is Dr. Thomas Stanley, died tragically in a car accident in August 2015. Rest his soul. He also wrote a much more popular book called The Millionaire Next Door. Yeah. 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 And what he did in this book that was more powerful than the first book is that was about people at a million dollars. But you and I both know a million dollars in net worth doesn't do the job. So if you're listening right now, you think a million dollars in net worth does the job, <laughs> start listening to your business, your wealth, and you'll find out it's not enough. Although 
he took and said, well, based upon your income, the amount of money you're setting aside and when it is you want to have financial independence and are you on trend to have enough on your balance sheet to replace your income? And he called that balance sheet wealth. And then he articulated in the book how so many people are trying to buy little pieces of what's called he calls the glittering rich lifestyle. These are the people that are worth over $20 million and have over $2 million a year of income. Those people, we can't have the four cars they have. We can't have the $10 million house that they have. We can't do any of those things, but we can do some of those things. Now, here's the best example of that. I was at a cigar shop with one of my employees long ago. And when I was at the cigar shop, now I'm buying all the cigars to go back to the hotel with, but this one guy, perfectly happy to let me pay hundreds of dollars for the cigars we're bringing back for this bigger group. And he says, hey, by the way, do you have a nice cigar cutter? Like something in the 75 to hundred dollar range. That's a perfect example. Little tiny piece, a little Calibri cigar cutter that costs a hundred dollars. So he has a little piece of the glittering rich lifestyle. And then he goes back to the hotel and is able to cut these cigars with this super nice thing. And he's like, yeah, no big deal. I just bought it. And it's like, wait a second. And I, and I said to him, like, like, I had given him this book. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I just want a really nice one. I was like, he's giving me eight cigar cutters for free. I'll give you a half. You can have all of them when we're done. He's like, yeah, but those are the cheap ones. They're going to break. There's eight of them. If you don't lose them, they will probably last you the rest of your life. And uh, that is the perfect example. So people don't get everything, but they get one of those things. They get just the boat that the Glittering Rich can get or just the car the Glittering Rich can get or just they'll take the vacation the Glittering Rich can get. Now, they do all of those things, but we buy pieces of their lifestyle. No wonder the Kardashians are so popular on Instagram or wherever else. People are looking for, what little things can I do? I was at Starbucks this morning and two women getting on the bus, one of them had a Calvin Klein bag because it's the only part of the Glittering Rich lifestyle she could afford. And yet it's eroding their capacity to build balance sheet wealth. Hey guys, thanks for watching this week's episode. We hope you really enjoyed it. If you love the people and stories of the Puget Sound, please support this podcast by reviewing us and rating us on Apple Podcasts. Stay tuned next week as we continue to curate the underground.